Hello, this is JC Santana coming to you from the Institute of Human Performance. We're going to be doing something a little bit different, a little different format, talking about many of the same, same uh, topics, but in a little bit more illustrative way. We're going to be bringing videos. It's just not going to be me yapping and yapping. So you guys know this, and I'm going to be talking about this until I'm blue in the face and until you're tired, okay? Uh, and still, after that, I'm going to be talking about it some more. And you know me. I like to give credit where credit is due. And I love to pay respect to the giants that came before me, which has been lost in this new generation that they want to put out stuff like if it was their own. And it's not their own. It's not their own. It was there before. And sometimes they even straight up take it, borrow it, steal it, whatever you want to call it from other people. And they don't even have the graciousness of giving credit. That ain't me. That's not IHP. That's not how I raise my kids. So much respect and much gratitude to the giants that came before me, Gary Gray, Vern Gambetta, Michael Clark, Paul Check, because they all talked about this to some degree. The guy that nailed it, the guy that nailed it in 1987 and 1995, documented in the NSCA journal, was Vern Gambetta. He had two articles, and the name of the articles were How Much Strength is Enough, and I borrow that term because it doesn't even get more descriptive or better. So thank you, Vern, for everything you've done for the industry. Uh, thank you for all the counseling that you've given me. And just thank you for, for being part of the strength and conditioning industry and adding so much to it. So anyways, we're going to be talking about how much strength is enough. But I'm going to give it a, a, little, um, a, a little twist uh, from a term that I believe I coined. Uh, I've never heard it before. That doesn't mean I... I invented it, maybe somebody else used it, but I haven't heard it uh, in the industry and now you're gonna hear about it and you've heard about it from me before. Training the genetic bandwidth. Training the genetic bandwidth. And this was inspired by the work of David Epstein in his TED Talk, I encourage all of you to see that talk, David Epstein on, on, uh, on YouTube, TED Talk, about 15 minutes. And then uh, reading his uh, book, Sports Gene. All of the stuff that I'm talking about was inspired and clarified by David and Epstein, all right? And it goes really, really well with how much strength is enough that uh, Vern Gambetta noticed in 1987, all right? So I have a gym. I've had gyms now for one way or another 30, uh, 30 years, and I've worked in, my gym, in, in a gym since I was 14, managed my, uh, the first gym at 14, 15, Brody's gym down in uh, North River Drive in Miami. So I've been in this for, for quite a while, quite a while. And I've seen just about everything, man. I've seen strength training taken to umpteenth levels. I've had the great opportunity uh, to train with uh, national caliber Olympic weightlifters and power lifters and bodybuilders. And I was groomed with that at the age of 14, 15. So I know my way around a gym and I know my way around training. And I can tell you the history of many techniques that are used today, and some of them are seen as novel, all right? Uh, they're not novel. We were doing those in the, in the 70s. So let's talk about, I'm going to have my coffee and I'm going to have my notes, so we're, we're right there. Let's talk about modern strength training. I once heard from a, from a, a great, great uh, physiologist, uh, Mike Stone, Dr. Mike Stone, much love to him and his lovely wife, uh, Meg Stone, for just pushing the envelope. And Mike Stone one day said, you know, you can never be strong enough. And he said it in jest. Uh, of course, uh, Mike Stone has never been a proponent of becoming so strong where you're hurting yourself. Nobody does that. So thank you, Mike. You, you're an awesome guy. And thank you, Meg, for everything you've added to the industry. But that, that thought, you can never be strong enough, in the hands of people who don't think can be dangerous. Very much like when Tito Ortiz was headlining uh, UFC and uh, he would go to Big Bear and he says, now I'm training for the title. Now instead of four hours, I'm training eight hours. He really wasn't training eight hours. He might have spent eight hours in the gym, but he wasn't training for eight hours. So what does a young martial artist do with that information? He starts to train eight hours, okay? What does a young strength and conditioning coach uh, get from Mike Stone saying you can never be strong enough? Well, you know, a 400-pound deadlift is better than a 300-pound deadlift. What are you? I'm a basketball player, but... You know, if you can never be strong enough and I'm deadlifting 300 pounds for a single, um, 350 is going to make, make me a higher jumper, a stronger basketball player, okay? 
And that misinterpretation, I think, has gotten us in a lot of trouble. Never in the history of sports medicine have we seen more, more abuse injuries, not contact injuries, abusive injuries, injuries due to wear and tear. Injuries created in the same environment that's meant to nurture you, which is a gym. Why? Because people are pursuing 300, 350, 400, 450, 500 on the squat, on the deadlift, on the high pulls, on the cleans, on the snatches, and on and on and on and on. We're selling agility ladders, bullet belts, and all of these SAQ pieces of equipment that were popularized by Randy Smythe in the 80s. I was part of that revolution, SAQ, and you can see my videos. I co-wrote uh, um, books with uh, Lee Brown and uh, Vance Ferrigno and other great, great authors like Stephen Plisk uh, and John Graham on SAQ, okay? And I was a co-editor on, on those books, and, and um, I kind of arranged the selection of exercises. So we went off on SAQ, and you could never do enough drills on the agility ladder. You can never do enough drills on the side strike. You can never do enough drills on the hurdles. And we went a crazy on these drills, thinking that the better we did the drills, the more we lifted, the stronger we got, the better football player we were gonna become, the better basketball player we were gonna become, the better baseball player, tennis player, or soccer player. And it turned out that that was not the case. Pretty much, I'll give you a, a, an example. I'm a frustrated musician, and you know that when you're learning piano, you learn scales. Da -da 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 That's to get dexterity in the hands. But if you look at the best, the best songwriters, songwriters, you know anybody from uh, Stevie Wonder down to Sting and and all the contemporary, the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and all the contemporary artists and bands and individual artists like Elton John and, and, and those types of guys, and you look at the prowess on the piano, none of them are classical pianists. None of them kill scales, okay? That's not their gig. They have enough dexterity to play the piano, to play the guitar, and compose. But what makes them the artist is not the speed. That's not. As a matter of fact, the fastest people that do scales are probably, you don't even know them because they're not that great of musicians. They're great technicians. They may be great teachers. They may be able to demonstrate a scale at lightning speed, but that doesn't mean that they can compose. That doesn't mean that can, they can up and slow and up and slow it down and move you with their music. That's a musician. That's a musician. So to be a technician on scales and be a musician is a long jump. To be a great, great guy on an agility ladder, okay, uh, and to be a great wide receiver, that's a different thing, man. Uh, I don't think Messi, I don't think Jerry Rice, I don't think none of that, I don't think Kobe, Michael Jordan, Federer, none of those guys, I don't think no, those guys would kill an agility ladder. I mean, we got guys on the internet that are going ape shit on the agility ladders, you know, and, and straight up stupid stuff, right? Uh, we'll, which we'll show later. So we have to take a step back and say, what is training? What is training? What are, what, what's the equipment? What is it made for? How much should I master it? At what point does it become a point of diminishing returns? How much agility ladder do I have to do to teach my feet how to move? Now, once I teach my feet how to move, I gotta teach them how to move for boxing. I gotta teach them how to move for soccer. I gotta teach them how to move for basketball. I don't keep teaching it how to do another agility ladder move because, oh, it's a new one that I'm gonna learn so it's gonna make my feet uh, faster. No, it gets to the point where you get better at the agility ladder, all right, and no better at soccer. So you're spending hours on agility ladder and showing off on the agility ladder and you're getting pummeled in soccer. You're not getting that scholarship. You're not getting that raise in your contract. You're not winning the titles. The same thing goes for every training method you can think of. The same thing goes for weight, okay? All right, if you, if you have a 150 pound deadlift, let's say, okay, and you're a 200 pound guy and you play football or you play basketball, doesn't matter, and you have a 150 pound deadlift, you go, okay, at, a, at 200 pounds, just generally speaking, but he's a hell of a basketball player or a hell of a soccer player, uh, it, it, might, it might, just from experience, anecdotal stuff, 
it might help him to get a little bit of strength to move a little faster. Maybe to move his deadlift to, let's say, 200. Maybe you should uh, deadlift body weight. Maybe body weight is, is the number, and I'm not saying that it is, but maybe that's the number. And when you get to 200 pounds, deadlift, you're done. You just keep practicing deadlifts for five, deadlift for five. You never get hurt, and you have enough strength for movement in soccer, jumping in basketball, uh, agility in, in, in boxing. See? So searching and pursuing that 250, 300, 350 over the course of high school, college, and then the pros is not necessary. And it's that pursuit that ends up, all right, causing knee problems, hip problems, elbow problems. And before you know it, we have artificial joints. Why? Not necessary, all right? So I kind of gave you the, um, that, that synopsis of what we're going to be talking about. 